Thank you for joining and welcome to Lead Dev Bookmarked. Lead Dev is a global community of engineering leaders who come together to discuss all things leadership, teams, tools, and tech. Bookmarked is our monthly uh, book club that takes place on the first uh, Tuesday of every month. Our sessions cover an array of engineering and leadership books that our awesome Lead Dev audience can draw insights and practical experiences from. I'm Susan Bond. I'll be your moderate. I'll be your moderator. Uh, I'm a former COO of a scaling startup and an executive coach. My specialty is uh, tech leaders. You can find me on Twitter at Susan Bond. Today we'll be talking about effective remote work. If you have questions for James, please pop them in the Q and A feature on Zoom, and I'll be. Uh, I'll make sure to get to them in the conversation. Um, Dr. James uh, Stanier is a computer science PhD who made the jump from software engineer to manager and has never looked back. He is a director of engineering at Shopify. James has written about his experiences on his blog, The Engineering Manager, and recently published Effective Remote Work with Program Pragmatic Programmers. I always stumble over it. that. It's I tricky. always stumble over it's that. Tricky. It's a tongue twister. Um, he previously wrote Become an Effective Software Engineering Manager, and we've mm. talked before. So we welcome. I'm so happy to have you here again. Yeah, I mean, like, you have to write an entire book to get to spend time with you. So, you know, <laughs> it, it's been a long time coming, right? <laughs> what a funny requirement. Um, I mean, this is like one of the favorite things I do, really, all month. I look so look forward to it. When I heard about this, I was really excited. So this is your second book. How did it come about? Were you like planning to write a series of books? No, I honestly wasn't. It, <laughs> it, it was funny. I, I I wrote the first book and I, I I wouldn't say I loved writing the book. Writing a book is hard work. I loved having written the book. The, uh -huh. the looking that back part. was fantastic. Type two fun, definitely. And I sort of, after that experience of spending a lot of time working really hard on it and working a full-time job, I said I'd never write another book for many years. But then... The pandemic happened, we went remote. I went very remote by moving myself, my family across the country, navigating all of these things. I started writing about it. I ended up just talking to the publisher and saying, hey, like, this is a thing, it's happening. And I'm assuming someone's gonna write a book about this. I kind of feel like I could, why not me, was, was the pitch. Um, and I'd written with them before and, and they were excited, I was excited. It was very different though, because the first book was, I wrote my blog for many years and manifested a pool of material that then I drew a whole load of things from in a single narrative arc. The second one was very much, I'm gonna write this book and I have no idea what's gonna be in it. So it was a different journey, um, but it was an enjoyable one nonetheless. Yeah, that, that, is a, that is a totally different journey. Well, when you, um, so when, let's talk about like when March, 2020 happened, were you already, Working remote, remote first? No. The day before the pandemic, I was talking at QCon in London. Oh, wow. And I went to London and then I was reading all the news about what was going on with the pandemic. I remember not going to the networking events because I stayed in my room because I was really nervous and I didn't know what was going on. And I was like talking to my partner. I was like, okay, I'm going to just give the talk in the morning. And I'm going to come home and that's it. And yeah, it was a, a bizarre time. The sort of people not knowing what to do with space and hand sanitizing and all this kind of thing. Went home the day after and then had pings from the conference that some people had gotten COVID. And additionally, later that day was the lockdown announcement in the UK. So it all just went woof very quickly. So no, I hadn't been remote before. And I think my perception of remote work previously was that it was much more niche. It was a, a, a specialist thing it was the the realm of automatic and, and base camp and a few others but not for the masses if you know what I mean I think there was a lot of that perception for folks it's interesting because I mean I work for myself you know I've been I've, I've been working from my home office for many many years and I coach clients and I mean I do work in person but I coach clients over the Oh, well, over the phone, over Zoom all the time. So mm -hmm. it's interesting for me, it wasn't, that wasn't very different. I mean, obviously other things were different. You know, I, uh, my worst pandemic purchase was um, spending way too much money for our, some toilet paper on, on uh, e in an eBay auction. <laughs> that was my, <laughs> my, <laughs> I was a little panicked. I spent way too much money for it. Um, so that was, you know, but I think for a lot of folks, it really changed not only the way that folks operated, but the way companies operated. 
Oh, absolutely. And I think that's partially why I found it so strange to begin with, in the sense that I, it wasn't a small startup at that time. It was a, a big company that then ended up selling a year later. But having come from the startup world of community, physical presence, um, the hive of activity of an office being the nucleus of creativity and innovation, that kind of thing was just embedded in the way that you worked in technology, at least in my mind. And it, it kind of seems silly in retrospect because you think back when you're sitting at your desk, even if you're in an office, all of the tools that you're collaborating with other people with are all via the internet. You know, you're you're using pull requests, you're doing video calls to other offices. It's all there, like the tools were there. But there was something about maybe 40 or 50 years worth of working in offices that was just this kind of big inertia that wasn't moving. Um, but the pandemic really just pushed it. And um, it was a, a real step change. I, I I totally agree. That's why I was so excited. I thought, oh, I think a lot. And, and it's interesting because you were navigating it as you're writing the book. You know, that, that perspective of somebody who's been immersed in this world suddenly is really interesting, right? Rather than someone who'd been doing it for a long time. I don't even know. Like, it's just part of my life at this point. So like, like immersing yourself. And so was that, were you taking like, notes as were you writing to yourself as you you know were trying to understand it yeah i mean i think i was i was writing blog posts as we were as we were just learning how to hire people onboard them remotely um how we were trying to navigate never seeing each other in person being away from meeting rooms being away from whiteboards how we do pair programming remotely like all of these things where the office was this kind of physical manifestation of the way that you work together, like a symbolic thing of, of whiteboards and rooms and spaces. And that incidental use of all of that, where you know you bump into someone, you have a conversation, and you realize that actually you're trying to replicate this world where that is happening by accident and you have to make it a push instead and you have to make it happen. So it, it was just kind of, as we were going through that for many months, it's like, okay, so these are this is all of interesting tools that we're building up in our tool belt here. And then as they started to assemble in my in my notepad, in my blog post, I was like, this could be another book because everyone's going through this. Yeah, lot, lots of people. I mean, and now, you know, hybrid and remote first is, I think it's really radically changed the business model, at least for the new near-term future. Who knows, like our long-term future and, you know, what it will look like. But for the near-term future, hybrid and remote first is much more, you know, there's many more folks doing that than were before the pandemic. Absolutely. I mean, I think many of us have just realized that perhaps that hour commute every single day, each way, wasn't particularly desirable and that they could be productive at home with the, the proper provisions and space and and they can spend more time with their families and and just generally be more flexible and available and it's interesting you you mentioned the sort of remote first thing and the hybrid thing like hybrid is very interesting to me because mm. it's actually i think the hardest configuration to do right it, it really is in the sense that if you are all in on being in the office then that's fine because you have one world-class office experience to try and provide and if you're all in on remote then you have one world-class remote experience you're focused right yeah but at least like hybrid you now got to do both and to an extent the two aren't completely compatible because the things that make offices great are not necessarily the things that are good for remote workers because we've all been in the pre-pandemic pre-remote first world the person working from home for one day and then we're not getting in on conversations we're looking in on a meeting room where there's lots of people sitting around the table we can't even really see their faces we can't even hear them so getting the experience right for both worlds at that intersection of hybrid is really hard yeah i remember uh when i was um working at travis um, as a coo the whole leadership team was going to meet in berlin and I got sick. I got like a stomach thing. And you, you're not traveling with a stomach thing, um, you know. And so I stayed home and I was like beamed in and everybody else was there. And it was just the most, and I was getting up at five in the morning too, because that's when, you know, they pushed the meetings late for me. But, you know, I was getting up at five in the morning and curling up. And uh, it was a really interesting experience of that hybrid experience. I, I really got that you know, in a very specific way. Well, so what are the things that folks should consider, you know, if they're in a hybrid environment, you know, what are those, those, some of those flashpoints or some tips you might offer them? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, one of the 
the takeaways from the whole book, I guess, if, if there's just like a few things you could take away, is that mindset of just treating everybody as remote is such a powerful thing because it applies at all levels. And, you know, I think hybrid is great. It caters for people who want some physical co-working experience. It caters for people being um, remote. Personally, I, I'm fully remote in, in, in Shopify. Shopify is fully remote, so we don't have to deal with this to an extent. But for hybrid, if you if you have it from the leadership down that everyone is treated as remote, then it's kind of a guide through many things. So, for example, it can manifest in simple things like when you join a meeting, which will inevitably be on a video call, you don't have it so that there's a meeting room dialing in with five people around the table. Everyone joins with a separate connection, microphone, webcam, so that the interface into the working experience is the same for every single person, regardless of where they are. And that's that's really important. But then, you know, that can go up to, to the leadership level of how you distribute work across different regions, how you think about collaboration, how you spend money on people in terms of their perks and benefits. You know, if you treat everybody as remote, then really the office becomes a co-working space um, rather than a, a magnetic hub for the company. Yeah, that's so good. I mean, I think we, we sort of... Uh, the hybrid is interesting and we sort of forget, you know, some of those things sometimes and under, it is, it's much harder. It's a much harder situation. Again, like you said, cause you gotta, you're looking at multiple experiences and needs. Exactly. And I think also related to that is the, like every organization has the center of gravity and the sort of mm. the, the pull of that center of gravity increases as you go to the tops of the company. And I think even if you try your best to treat everybody as remote or to provide a fantastic world-class hybrid experience if all of the exec team all go to the office every single day the same office then you just can't help the fact that the organization's center of gravity is there it just is so yep that's a kind of a pitch for you know execs and people who lead companies it's like if you really want to experience this in a way that will improve remote working for everyone in the organization then the exec team should also be remote they should have the same input as everyone else, internet, webcam, microphone, maybe a light if you've got bad lighting, but it's mm-hmm. the same for everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it does. I mean, it's like my experience of being remote. And then also, you know, our, we, had a, we had an office, a headquarters in Berlin. My whole team was there, but I was the only one remote on my team and I was leading the team, which was a great, it was such a great equalizer for, for and made me think a lot more about, the tools and the way we communicated. And, you know, I remember we had a a big meeting about like, okay, so who's going to communicate what and who needs to know what? And we had this whole rubric. We spent, you know, an afternoon on what's the rubric for how our team is going to communicate when I'm hours behind you and you all are there and you're talking about things. How do we make sure that we're all communicating as a team and we're not jumping over each other? Yeah, that's a really important point. And there's, there's a part of the book where we go into that. It's kind of establishing norms for teams and, you know, you can almost produce a matrix of like different forms of communication and then under what situations do they apply? Because, you know, I mean, we can talk a, about the sort of experience of, of working from home from like a, a health and, and, and mental health perspective, but you want to make sure that whatever means of communication that you use, and there are tons, you know, from chat to video to emails to SMSs, that you know what to ignore outside of working hours and you can feel comfortable ignoring them but you always have a route in if something's very urgent to get someone if, if you need to. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of norms, that rubric is, is, is super important for teams. Mm, you have to be a lot more intentional about it. I think that, that in offices, we're just more, we do these things and it's implicit and the, mm. we have these routines and we, we aren't intentional. And I think actually that's a great thing. I think we should be more intentional about how do we communicate? How do we make sure information is disseminated? Who gets to make decisions? How decisions are made? I think all of this for me, I'm kind of a little excited <laughs> because it means we're more intentional about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always remember working in a, a pre GitHub world where there weren't pull requests. So People would review code in an office by either like reviewing the commits on their screen or they maybe even just go and sit next to the person who is proposing the change and then talk through it with them. They maybe make some changes. But then all of those changes that were made were lost. Whereas if you're intentional, we say you use a pull request, then you get to look at an old pull request and see what happened in the reviews and what changed as a result. Like you, you leave that trail as well, which is which is great. 
Yeah. And on that note, um, you know, like we often talk about like async and synchronous communication. And I think we talk about them in a duality, perhaps, you know, like in a, in a binary, but you talk about them on a spectrum. And I really love that. Can you tell us a little bit more about the nuance and how you see them on a spectrum? Yeah, sure. So there's, there's a chapter that's kind of based around this, this diagram and it's, it really is just a, a line with arrows either end and there's synchronous at one end and asynchronous at the other end. But then it, it plots all the different forms of communication from things that are completely synchronous, like a video call or a face-to-face -face conversation, like you've got to be there, same time, same format, same location, even if the location is a Zoom room. Um, and then there's things that are like completely asynchronous, like a readme file where someone might write it in 1986 for some old C tool or something, and it's still relevant now, like it's it's completely asynchronous. But the middle is a, is a fuzzy area and, you know, it comes back to what you were saying around how do you use these things for different situations? Because emails are more archival than chat. Like an email, you kind of expect to be searchable forever. If you're sending someone like a job offer, it's done via an email because it's kind of official, right? But chat is less official. It's less archived. It might have a retention. So there's different expectations. So like a, a chat message or a DM, maybe you'd expect to a few hours turnaround or a day's turnaround, whereas an email like a week's turnaround is probably okay. So it's you can kind of spread things across this sync async spectrum. And actually there's a lot of nuance that prizes out when you pull them all apart. I love that. I mean, I, I hadn't really thought about it that way, I'll be honest. And I thought, oh, that's so interesting about the spectrum. I mean, so what should we consider when it comes to like making, you know, is there rubrics or things we should consider around when do we do async versus sync and how do we think about that? About what's the right tool, the right way? Yeah, totally. And it's, it's different for every team. I mean, I think, you know, they are tools rather than prescriptions in this sense. And yeah. one of the things I get into in the diagram in the chapter as well is that you can you can lay things out from synchronous to asynchronous, but you can also use the same spectrum for other properties as well. So the more asynchronous something is, the more permanent it is as well. So face-to-face yep. -face chat in an office is zero permanence because as soon as we finish talking the content other than what we remember has vanished into thin air and you can't really recover it unless you ask someone whereas you know right and our thinking, memories also we have different memories of what happened right and now we yeah. have different lenses mm -hmm. exactly and even, and even you know miscommunication might mean that our our lens is totally mismatched so exploring sort of synchronous and asynchronous also means you think about okay well how as a team do we communicate in such a way that we create an audit log of decisions we've made or index the things that we've the, that we've done over time or make it discoverable as to what we're working on and, and then how can you shift your team's way of working so that you can somehow tick both criteria at the same time so okay so when we make decisions in our project we make those decisions on our wiki page and we have a log of decisions because that doesn't just help us as a team knowing where we've been over time other people can discover that as well and I think the the sort of final property as well as synchronous asynchronous and permanent impermanent the thing that works in the other direction and it's often a, a sort of attention is sort of connected connectedness as humans and feeling like we've actually you know done something together and felt like we've talked to a human being in the same way that i am now um because if you go too asynchronous as a team if you exist only in a written world or a recorded world then it, it lacks that kind of thing that makes us human. You know, we've evolved since the beginning of time to be working with others and to collaborate with others and to feel connected to others, similar interests and skills and all these kinds of things. And if we go too far in the, in the sort of asynchronous direction, then some of the bit that makes work really enjoyable, which is that connection and collaboration with other human beings, we can use, we can just lose it. So you have to almost sometimes push back and not be so written in the way that you communicate because you want to feel like you've connected to other people. Well, yeah, I mean, it makes me think about too, even before the pandemic, I feel like there was this move of like, ugh, meetings and like reducing meetings down to nothing. And I think it's really admirable, but at the same time, what are you losing in connection when you don't meet as humans at all, even on a video call? How is, and then how does that impact and add friction to the work when we when our relationships are sort of loosened or or frayed. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that there's ways to navigate that. And I mean, mm. certainly the people who don't like meetings would probably like better run meetings 
And uh, there's there's tons of examples in the book of, of good ways to, to run meetings. One I really like is, um, it's not my idea, it's called the silent meeting. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. It's where you, everyone's experienced this, where someone calls a meeting, it's in the calendar, they're like, hey, everybody, let's talk about this thing. I've written up these thoughts. Can you please go and read it before the meeting? And then when we get in the meeting, we'll all talk about it. And then it rolls around. Few people have read it. Some people haven't. Few people skim read it. And then it's just a mess where the people who've read it get frustrated that other people haven't. So you can run these things called silent meetings where, you know, you schedule the time for the meeting. But like take the first 10 minutes, 15 minutes to just join the call, turn your cameras off, mute, just read the thing together. And then, yeah, the idea of like making sure we're all on the same page, right? So that we all have, we've all had the same 10 or 15 minutes to really absorb this document and to build it into that meeting rather than saying, oh, well, you have to do it beforehand. Or sometimes maybe we did it a few days and then we forget. Yeah, I got yeah. it. So it's a way to get people on board. Absolutely. And, you know, I think definitely I'm an advocate for deleting and killing meetings that are a waste of time. But meetings are great. And I think if teams, again, going back to establishing norms and a rubric, like if teams organize their time, so maybe they have deep focus in the morning and then there's a period of the afternoon where all the meetings always happen every day, if there are them, then that's great because people can plan the time around it. I think often the resistance is just sort of the calendar as a complete winner takes all situation. Like my, my calendar is this kind of open bag of sweets and everyone's trying to steal all my sweets all the time. I don't have any sweets, but um, that's the first thing that came to mind. Maybe I'm hungry. Um, but being more, into, again, it goes back to what you said about being more intentional. So people blocking out the calendar, like this is my focus time, people respecting that. There being a culture of respecting people's preferences of, to what they expose to the rest of the company that they're doing with their time. So I do the same thing. I, I tend to block out my mornings for deep work. It says deep work, don't book. Ask me, you know, you can make an exception. But it, I think if everyone participates in a culture like that, it does just reduce the friction around all of these things. I love that deep work, don't book or ask me. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, it, it's a fantastic way to sort of communicate and, and, set, and set the tone. I think you're right, though, too, about that we want better meetings. How many times have we all been in a meeting where it's a status and you're like, this is, and we're reading, and this week we're going to do this, and then this happened, and you're, you're bored. You're like, couldn't have this been done a different way? Are we having the right level of conversations at these meetings? Yeah, sure. And that's where you can use the spectrum diagram to push things down the spectrum. So it's like, this is a synchronous thing, is either boring or repetitive or not the best use of everyone's time. So shift it along the spectrum and be like, okay, well, this could be an email, this could be a document. And people realizing the power of written communication in a remote world in that it's a new skill that you can master and the impact that you can have is even greater than being the best public speaker at a company town hall because you could write the shared document that the entire company reads and changes their mind when they read it. You don't have to be a stereotypical, extroverted, kind of forceful person in order to make that happen. You can just be a quiet thinker with a good wielding of the keyboard. Mm, I love that you said that because we do think like to be a communicator means I'm standing and I'm keynoting or I'm all these slides and I'm very influential and I like people and I'm an extrovert and it's, communication is everywhere and yeah. there are many ways to do it many modes and different styles I hope that you that that what you said just encourage somebody to maybe write some communication documentation in their own way at their company yeah and there's some cool ways to do it like um some of the very senior engineers that we have at Shopify have their own mailing list that they've set up where people can subscribe and they'll write something interesting every two weeks, just ideas about where architecture is going or ideas about the products that they're working on. And, and, you know, you can really take control of the way that you distribute your ideas and you can build followings within your company. You can build connections with other teams by just using all of the tools that we use for like the public internet by having a newsletter or a, a mailing list or whatever, but you can do that inside your company as well with remote work and it, it works really well. Well, it's a good point too. Like what should folks consider when it comes to, like we've been talking about, we've been talking around tools, but what are things that people should consider or think about when, it, when they're choosing those? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there's all the obvious stuff, which is like, what can your company afford and what matches your security policy and what are you comfortable with? I mean, certainly if you can work towards the company in general, having the same set of tools, then the spread of your message or document or information widens by default because more people can see it by default. Um, I mean, we, you know, we use Google Docs. I love Google Docs. It's great. Like, there's a lot of things out there where you can get on free plans um, that, that do things that I couldn't even think were possible 20 years ago. So it's always there are great, but try and standardize as much as you can within your team, within your company. But I don't think I'm not sitting here advocating for like this tool over that tool because everyone's an individual. People's companies are different. And, and to an extent, it doesn't really matter. I think it's less to do with the tools that you pick and more to do with how you use them. You know, it, it really it really doesn't matter. But having a rough spread of everyone probably already has email, a good chat client is good, collaborative documents, a way of doing drawings that could be shared in a, in a way that's, that's not a pain. And you've pretty much ticked most of the boxes. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a fair perspective. We think like, oh, this is the, the big tool, this thing. But really it's, you know, tools are just tools. It's how we implement them and what's going on in the situation and what the suite of tools is and what's the right level. Sometimes we have way too many tools. I'm somebody, if you give me too many tools, I'm going to drop them off. Like I'm going to forget. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And just, just going with what you've got close to you. So for example, everyone or many people rather that's that's bias but many people use github um github has a whole bunch of stuff baked in like if you you can use github um gists you can use markdown files in your in your code bases to, to document decisions that you're making about your code like there's lots of stuff that's available to you that is fairly low-fi but is actually high impact at the same time you don't have to go out and subscribe with the enterprise plan to every expensive tool on the planet like a lot is already there for us Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I th it also strikes me too that the other thing we have to consider is there's a spectrum of people. Some people like a lot of structure and people really need less structure because of what they're like thinking engineering, lots of, you know, need lots of like time. They want to focus on the engineering rather than navigating all of that. And it's, so it's like, how do we find the right structure to meet both of those needs and the team while we're remote? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And everyone is an individual and Again, I go back to that that line of, you know, all of this is about tools rather than prescriptions in, in how you do things well. Like what works well for one company or one person does not necessarily work well for another. You have to find what you're comfortable with, what you're productive with, what you're happy with, and then start from there and then go outwards. Mm, I love that. Well, so I want to turn more towards um, us as individuals, right? Folks who are working from home and, you know, some of us have now been doing it a couple of years, um, but, but I thought it'd be great to talk about like, what do we need to think about when it comes to managing ourselves working remotely? Again, I've been doing it for so many years. I forget people. I can't answer this question anymore. Uh, I do it automatically, but so what, you know, what are some things that maybe you thought about or that other folks should think about? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think a lot has already been sort of written and spoken about looking after yourself, like through the pandemic, People were talking and writing a lot about making sure you've got like the right space set up, ergonomic space, you've got ability to have some kind of privacy and focus at home amongst the chaos of family life. Um, maybe if you are a routine based person, then mimicking the way in which you used to run your office based life in a way uh, that you do at home can work for you. So, for example, a fake commute either end of the day where you go for a walk or you go for a run you get out for lunch, you know, you make sure that you stand up and walk around, like all of those things can definitely help. But I mean, the thing that I think is definitely true though, is that everyone is an individual. So it all builds on the team norms. So if a team has norms and they know how they communicate, then flexibility can be like the ring that is concentrically wrapped around it and people being in tune with what makes them happy and what works for them. So for one person who may like solid routine with a fake community at either end of the day and lunch break at the same time every day, there may be people who actually like to completely blend their life with their work. And maybe they're sort of interruptible a lot all throughout the day. Maybe they'll work late in the evening because they've got childcare in, in the day. Like all of that is totally fine. So I think it's about individuals sort of introspecting and realizing what works for them in terms of their mood, their energy, their happiness, supporting their home life as well. And then teams understanding what that is and then using their norms in order to sort of normalize that all in the middle. So, you know, I work with people who 
love focus. They like just being start of the day, end of the day, no interruptions, like just work. And then in the evenings, they're like fully family, homework, dropping children to different activities. And then there's some people who just love blending it all. And actually they'll sort of work some early morning shifts because they actually like getting up early or some late shifts because maybe they've got an idea to work on in the evening. Like it's just whatever works for each person as long as you're mindful of how you're feeling, paying attention to signs of burnout, making sure your team understand how you work and why you work and so on. Yeah, you remind me, I'm like, I do know a few of the things that I do. So for example, I work in the morning. I In the morning, I don't have meetings mostly before, sometimes at nine, but almost not before 10 o'clock. And I try not to look at my phone before I've spent time with myself mm. because I really want to think about, you know, I want to connect with myself before the day because like a lot of people who manage and lead, my whole day as a coach, I spend focused on other people. I'm not really thinking about myself because as a, a coach, my job is to basically be a conduit for other people. Mm -hmm. And so I spend the first part of the day with myself. I'm, you know, listening to music, I'm journaling, I'm reading, you know, I'm, I'm spending that time with myself. Um, Also at the end of the day, I I try to change my clothes at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I put on, you know, I've been really into cashmere joggers. I got them deeply on sale. And so I wear, I, at the end of the day, I'm like, it's cashmere, it's comfy pet time as my partner and I call it, you know, it's comfy pant time. And we put on cashmere joggers and I change that to signal, you know, the end, the end of the day, you know, when I want a creative break, I will uh, get out of the house and go grab my favorite matcha. And then yeah. it's funny, I'll say, Oh, I'm taking a break, and I'll feel guilty. And then what happens is, I will end up on my phone with like writing, like three different articles on my phone while I'm on the on the train and, and all of that. So yeah, I remember, like, those are some of the things that I do. Do you have a couple of your favorite things that you do, just for yeah. people to have ideas? get a dog that that really helps i mean um you know walking the dog every morning is just it's just an amazing thing because you have to do it like i can't not do it it has to happen and i know what i'm like which is like i'm very sort of like to-do list accomplishment focused and i knew that if i didn't have the dog walk to do i just sit on the computer straight away so having things there that pull me away in the it's beneficial for me because I come back from the dog walk, I feel more centered, I feel relaxed, I feel ready to start my day. Um, so I think it, it's a yeah, dog, dog thing, definitely. The change of clothes thing, totally. I, I, I would also advocate like, you know, a, a change of, of trouser, a trouser to a short, a short to a jean. It kind of switches your brain into different modes. Uh, maybe that's just me. Um, and also if you can, if you do have the space to, leave the area where your computer lives even if it's something as simple as just like putting your laptop in the drawer a a symbolic gesture of this is over until tomorrow is really really meaningful and um it it can have a surprising effect i totally agree well i thought we would just share ours real quickly like for other folks and maybe inspiration i'd love to hear what other folks do um a couple last quick questions so you know, we think about, I mean, we're at home a lot more, which means we're in our local communities much more than, than ever, right? When we're not going into an office, a lot of times, sometimes we're in our local community when we were, we were in offices, but a lot of times we were, people had, I know in the United States, the average commute, 30, 45 minutes. I, I don't remember now what it was, but I'm curious what you think about the impact could be of being remote first or fully remote, like on our local communities. Yeah. I mean, I think, Certainly, I've been much more mindful of not going on Amazon and buying that thing that actually I could use the local shop for. Because mm. there's lots of communities out there that, that have really, really struggled because people move away from them. It's that whole kind of brain drain situation. And certainly where I live now, 20 years ago, anyone who wanted to work in particular industries like technology or engineering or any of the sort of typical kind of like office based communities, like there wasn't that work here at all. So lots of people would would grow up here and then leave, but now we're able to come back and be in these places, which is really fantastic. So supporting your local community, using the coffee shops, using the local stores, uh, I think is fantastic. But I think what's also really nice is kind of a, a sort of a wider arc of that is that having people be remote goes to show the next generation that these kinds of careers are possible, regardless of where people grew up. Because, you know, we've all seen 
decades ago, people having to change country, move away from families, completely upend their life in order to get a shot at doing the kind of job that they wanted to do. But now it's legitimately possible that the person who grows up in the remotest community, as long as they've got an internet connection, they could teach themselves to code or do a boot camp to learn to code and they could get a job programming. And it doesn't matter where they are. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter their background because all of the tools that are available to the most experienced, incredible engineer are the same ones, pretty much, that are available to most people. So that to me is an amazing thing. I love that. I mean, listen, I have tears in my eyes because that was my parents' journey. You know, my parents grew up in rural Iowa. My mom grew up on a farm. You know, they would wake up and have to like move the chickens and grab the chickens and move them from one hen house to another. And, you know, they lived in these teeny tiny towns. And my dad got a degree in mechanical engineering and he didn't want to work for John Deere, which was the only game in town. And so they moved to Detroit in order so that my dad could be a design engineer Mm -hmm. um, at GM where he spent his entire career and they left their entire family. They were the only people who uh, the the, the rest of their family are actually all still in Iowa. And, you know, these days it's like easier to travel around, but like that speaks exactly to my parents' story, you know, that my dad had to move. And in the future, maybe we don't have to. It's true. I mean, the same thing happened to my partner. Like she, you know, I'm sure she wouldn't mind me saying like, really argued with her mom about moving away from home to go to university because she wanted to do design and you know she had to spend a decade away from her parents establishing her career in London whereas now that could have never had to have happened it could have been just as accessible as going online to check the news is an entire world of work as well yeah, it's so it, it's so exciting. Well, I want to end on one last quick question. We've just got a few minutes. Um, I'm just curious, what surprised you most about being remote? Was there anything that surprised you? That's a good question. That you liked or didn't like, or that you were just like, oh, this is different than what I thought. A few things come to mind. One of them, I was surprised by how, without thinking, I would subject myself to living in places that were not the best and spending a long time commuting and spending money on like a car parking space in a city and all of these things, which as soon as remote happened, I was like, why was I doing that? Was it just sort of a, a herd behavior thing where it's like, everyone's doing this, so it's normal, so it's fine. Mm-hmm. So that definitely surprised me because I'm, I'm just as productive at home. I think what also surprised me on the flip side is that even though I'm, believe it or not, I am fairly introverted, seeing people in person still is incredibly invigorating after being remote. So one of the things that we do at Shopify is is people get together, you know, in in various places around the world to meet their teams, to work together. And it's very easy to do so. And I was a bit hesitant going to see one of the teams for the first time. I was like, oh man, like all this travel. And, but I came away like, yes, like I'm really excited about what we're building in the future and everything is great because that connection with humans. So that surprised me as well, that actually that is still is incredibly important. And I think also a lot of it was, was sort of unpicking myself in a way, in that revealing to myself sometimes my addiction with work and being always on and always checking and how being in the office stops that from happening for me because it put the barrier up at the beginning and end of the day. You know, you had to commute in, you had to commute out. Often you wouldn't talk to your colleagues as much digitally because you talk to them in the office, but in a world of complete connectivity and home, I didn't realize how addicted I was and how I always had the FOMO thing all the time, especially now that I work with many people in the US and Canada compared to before. So it's kind of been a a, a journey of self-discovery and sort of learning my habits and my cycles that I work to and trying to unpick the bad ones and reestablish a healthy uh, interface for my work, I think. I think a lot of us are doing that. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for joining us for this, this, this session. James will be joining us over on the Lead Dev Slack, where he will be taking some questions. Head over to the uh, Bookmarked channel, where that'll be taking place. Our next session will be May 10th where we'll be speaking with Kim Scott on her book, Just Work. For those of you who remember, she did uh, Radical Candor. This is her next book. And on June 7th, we'll be talking to Sarah Drasner on her book, Engineering Manager and Engineering Management for the Rest of Us. Thanks so much, everybody. See you on Slack.